you're going to Vietnam in 1965. At that time, did you have any idea what that was all about? Like, what's going on? Why am I going to Vietnam? Like, if somebody said, why are you going to Vietnam? Other than the Marine, the Marine Corps is telling me to. What's the, what's the answer to that question? Did you have any idea what was going on in Vietnam in 65? No, not really. Uh, we got over there and it was pretty crude, uh, you know. Uh, we got in, flew in there on C-130 at Chulai, and the airstrip was 2,500 feet martial matting. This is steel matting that's interlocked, mm -hmm. and they had parking areas, and the C-130 come in and landed, and it's all sandy and clay out there, and they said, see that? tent over there on that bank, which is about, oh, 200 yards away from where we was at, backside of that C-130. Said, uh, that's air freight, that tent. Mm. <laughs> and it was raining right down out of the middle. It was monsoon season. Mm. We stepped off that Marshall matting and went about that deep. You know what I'm talking about. In the mud. It, well, it was sandy, oh, sandy. mud, and uh, we walked over there, and we stood in the rain. And they sent a truck over, and it was a truck didn't have no cover on the back. It was open, so we get up in the truck, and it was still raining. We get over, and we check in the group with the colonel and the sergeant, group sergeant major. They said, "Well, we're going to bring a tent up here on this hillside," and there was grass, weeds, brush. And it's still raining right down out of the middle. And we had to put a tent up so we'd have a place to sleep that night. Yeah. And put our stuff up off of the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's how my life started so that's in your, Vietnam. That's your welcome to the Vietnam. first thing we did was send us down to the squadron I was assigned to. They'd give you a rifle and a cartridge belt and ammunition and a mess kit and a blanket and a, and a folding cot. And that's all they and, gave and us. You flew into Chulai, you said. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that right? And Chulai, if it, let me just, just show the students real quick. Here's a general division of, uh, of Vietnam, and we won't go into the background here, but um, you know, just to keep it simple, you know, we've got Vietnam is divided in the four parts in, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And then we come to South, when we focus on South of Vietnam, then you, South Vietnam is broken up into four, four sections, and, and the northernmost section is First Corps, but it's usually referred to as I Corps. And both Don and Ken served in, in I Corps. And you can see Don was just saying, he just mentioned Chu Lai. Did you fly into Da Nang? Is that where you came into the country? Or, or uh, yes. Okay, so you flew into, into Well, Danang. Well, we went in, come into Da Nang, but we, they, uh, they flew us on, on C-130 down there down there, on that Marshall down, May. Down they they had A4 Skyhawks there, and they yeah. were shooting them off with Jado bottles. You know what a Jado bottle is? No. It's just a booster. They they fasten them on the tail on both sides of the back of that thing, and then they rivet it up, and then they fire those Jado bottles, and it's just like a rocket, and it gets them off the ground. And then they had resting gear, just like on a carrier, on the aircraft to carrier, catch them yeah. because there's only Marshall oh. matting. I, had, the I wasn't off. over there about two weeks, and I had search and rescue at uh, Chulai Airstrip. We were just over the bank, over the hump, where the helicopters were from Chulai Airstrip. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night, one of these A4s went off, and one bottle kicked, kicked off, and the other one didn't. And it threw the uh, jet into a slide, and it tore the landing gears up. And they were loaded with bombs. and. 20 millimeter, and so mm. they don't even want that pilot to even bring, think about bringing it back because he'd get killed if he did. Yeah. So they go out there and they start circling and they called us and we were sitting there on the ground right by the tower and we fired up, went out, and the pilot, once they got everything arranged, the plane was just going in circles and uh, he ejected on the inbound mm. and we went out and Fished him out of the water. Got him. Mm -hmm. So Ken, let's switch to you. So you heard, you know, Don volunteered first by the time he gets to Vietnam for the first time, he's volunteered twice for the Marine Corps. 
you're in the you're in the army, and uh, your most of your service is way up here, right? Right by the yeah. demilitarized zone mm -hmm. between North and South Vietnam. Uh, how did you? How did you? Get, when did you get into the army, and, and how did you get into the army? Well, uh, I graduated out of high school in 1967, uh, and uh, I just worked construction for a year, and that was just kind of getting old, and. Uh, I had three older brothers, and they had all been in the army. One of my my oldest brother had been in Korea, and uh, I was just getting kind of tired of, you know, doing what I was doing. I mean, I was having a lot of fun, but uh, it just uh, was getting kind of old. So I went to the uh, the uh, the local uh, board there in uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, and I said, I don't know where my name is, but put it, take it, and put it at the top. And that's kind of like volunteering for the draft. So this I, is the I, selection board. The that selection board, who's, yeah. Who's get so I was baseball. considered a draftee, and that way, you know, I'd be in for just two years. I didn't want to, you know, that was the the basics. When you got drafted, you you serve for two years. So, yeah. and she tried to talk me out of it. You know, you sure you want to do that? And she about had me talked out of it. And I walked out the door, and I said, "Well, put my name at the top." So it wasn't. Uh, probably two weeks later, I got my little letter from my favorite uncle and he said uh, <clears throat> you know uncle sam uncle sam and he yeah. said mm -hmm. <laughs> he said uh, welcome aboard you know and so you're in the yeah, army now you're in the army now i went down to oklahoma city and had physical and all that good stuff so anyway i started out at fort bliss uh, texas in uh, 1968 uh, mm. uh, september and uh, did my training there and then i went from there to fort ord california and did uh, AIT, Advanced Infantry Training, and that was kind of a pretty good indication that you might be kind of headed for Vietnam because they had the mountains and the, mm -hmm. the uh, kind of mimics the uh, terrain in Vietnam and, we, you know, I had uh, map reading and, and escape and evasion and all that uh, good stuff. And uh, uh, I remember we was out in the bush uh, there at Fort Ord and uh, going over the nomenclature of the Claymore Mine, which is um, um, something we carried and set up around our perimeters. And I remember there was some California quails running around the whole time I'm watching these quails. And, and when I got to Vietnam, the first time I set up a Claymore Mine, I'm thinking, you know, I wish I'd paid a little more attention. <laughs> Because <laughs> now here I am. How to set up the mines. How to set up the mines. But anyway, yeah. it comes to you pretty fast. So, uh, now just, just you mentioned that. I mean, you're setting up, this is like when you're going to stay, stay somewhere overnight. And so you set yeah, up mines just right. in case mm -hmm. the enemy try to infiltrate. And right. They'll, they'll and they, the yeah, we, uh, you know, Claymore mines were just, and we also used them for booby traps. We could, we could rig them to where, you know, the, uh, it had a long cord and it had a little electrical thing that you squeeze that sent an electrical impulse down to set it off. Or if you wanted to set it up, uh, you know, we used them for booby traps uh, against the enemy and we'd use a battery and we'd have a, a clothes pin and, and, you know, when they hit the trip wire, it pulled it loose and there's a little tack in it. It's, you know, mm -hmm. anyway, it made contact with the wire. But yeah. so anyway, Claymore's was, you know, something we all had and carried. and. Uh, but it, you know, it came to me pretty quick. I remembered most of it. But uh, how to use them? How to use When, when them, did you arrive in Vietnam? Uh, October, I think, the twenty-second of nineteen sixty-nine. So you arrived in the latter part of of sixty-nine when mm -hmm. when Don first got there in sixty-five. <coughs> it's still Vietnam still isn't much in the news, and and there certainly mm -hmm. is no major protest movement. Mm -hmm. By the time you get there. In the latter part of '69, I mean, now, you know, it's it's, it's a huge event. It's on the front page of the newspapers every day. Every day. Uh, very, very divisive. When when Don gets to Vietnam, somebody says, other than the fact that the Marine Corps has ordered you to go to Vietnam, why are you going? He sounds like, well, I you know, don't really know what's right. going on. How about you? I mean, if somebody said, other than the fact that the Army telling you you have to go. I mean, but why is the army telling you you have to go? What, what's, why are you going to Vietnam? Well, you know, to fight communism, you know, yeah. was all that we knew. You know, that there was a people that were 
being suppressed and and uh, you know the communists was trying to take over them and that's that's kind of what was uh, you know preached to us yeah. and uh, and that was my whole thinking you know most of us didn't know all the background political things and you know all the huge mess that was yeah going on politically but anyway yeah. so and so when I got there I landed at Long Bend which is down by uh, Saigon at that time oh, it was gone. South, yeah. And I had a good friend that was stateside with me. We flew over together and he was a, a college grad and, and so the, some of the big brass there at Long Bend uh, was looking for somebody to take a bunch of china dishes up north to the uh, officers club up there. Mm -hmm. They said get somebody to help you and so he come and got me and I thought it was a round trip, but so we uh, we getting this. I think it's a C-130, uh, David, you, uh, the cargo that lets down in the back, and you walk up the ramp, and so we pack all these boxes of china dishes up north, and uh, they said, "Well, welcome to Icor. <laughs> You're oh, staying oh, here." Oh, really? Seriously? So that's that's how I got there. Originally in the south. South started. But what up. gets you up to the DMZ is actually delivering <laughs> dishes, bringing china dishes up to the officer. <laughs> right. Uh, let's let's. I, I want to ask you questions about this photo. I mean, uh, and then and then we'll we'll go back. We'll come back to Don and look at the photo of the of the Hilo. You're on the ground. You're spending a lot of time in the air. Um, you know. Um, you know much better than, than I do. I've been to Vietnam a couple of times, but I'm wearing baggy shorts and a loose flowing loose flowing shirts, and I'm I'm still thinking a lot about the heat and the humidity. Yep. Um, how much? Just looking at that photo right there, how much weight do you think you're carrying? Probably about sixty to sixty-five pounds. Sixty yeah. to sixty-five yeah. pounds, plus that steel helmet, and then you're getting out. I'm imagining you're spending time out in the jungle in the elephant grass right. where there's no breeze. Well, in the, yeah, in this particular area, we were uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin there on the coast. Very close uh, to the coast. Yeah. Coast, and uh, yeah. that's when we were assigned uh, there at the, uh, that was a uh, CB uh, fire base called Quaviet, and, mm -hmm. uh, and we were working out of that for a little while. This was in December. It would have been like uh, well, it had been 50 years ago today, probably when that picture was taken, it was December of, of 69. Wow. And, um, 50 years. So let's, let's look at that picture and, I mean, we're, we can see that you, you know, you're, some of the stuff that you're carrying is obvious. I can see, a, you know, the, the, the butt of a rifle there, I can see the ammunition. Looks like we've got a, a, a shovel. There, right. You've got other things in in your pack. Well, we all, is that a hand grenade I see down yeah, there? Yeah, we had uh, yeah on. half a dozen hand grenades. Uh, you know that we carried. We had uh, uh, each squad had an M60 machine gun uh, that David was talking about earlier in his presentation, and uh, everybody in the squad carried a couple hundred rounds because uh, M60 uh, was very. Uh, a good weapon to have because it could lay down a lot of fire real fast and so uh, and so everybody in the squad carried M60 uh, usually a couple hundred rounds and then uh, we carried our M16 we had a bandolier that ha held several magazines of uh, M16 and we had the Claymore mine everybody carried a Claymore mine uh, we set that out in front of our perimeter at night and uh, or like I said, it used it as a booby trap, and then we had uh, water and, and sea rations. Uh, I was the food you're carrying, yeah. Right, yeah, right. yeah. If we're going out legging it, uh, you know, we had to carry whatever you wanted to eat and drink and a poncho to try to keep as much of the rain off of you or have a place to lay down. And, and as a squad leader, I had a map there in my uh, uh, pocket and... Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, we had the oil up there in our hat and the brush to keep our weapons uh, oiled up and clean. Oh, that's right. You got it in your helmet there. Yeah. And uh, I, I had a, uh, that's a receiver on the <clears throat> on my helmet up there. As squad leaders had a, can't see it real good there, but I had a little radio and uh, a receiver there that we could communicate with our platoon leader and other squad leaders to try to 
because out in the jungle you couldn't uh, have visual contact a lot of the time. Right. So you know we had our yeah. little radios with us and mm. and uh, how long you you know uh, ask this question then then we'll we'll turn it back to Don. You know that you're going into a war zone. I mean that's obvious. I'm mm -hmm. going to Vietnam consequently right. into a war zone. Uh, now I'm in I Corps, so I'm definitely in a, in a war zone right now, right at the dividing line between North and South Vietnam. Um, how long were you in country before that was no longer an abstraction? Like, oh, I'm heading into war zone too. Like, wow, yeah, I'm really in a war zone. Well, you know, I was I was really prepped because I'd been to NCO school and and uh, so, you know at some advanced. Uh, military training and uh, you know the the military drives this in your head I thought by the time when we landed I thought by the time I exited the door to hit the end of the ramp I thought I'd have uh, be shot and jungle rot and dysentery and snake bit before I hit the end of the ramp that's <laughs> how that's uh, how. Yeah. <laughs> but no, uh, you know cool. I remember complaining to one of the old timers I'd been there a couple of weeks and I said you know I, I was young and stupid and gung-ho I guess but I said you know I come over here to fight a war and we've not made any contact with the enemy and, and he really jumped on me for that because he said you know every time we make contact somebody gets killed and it's probably a week after that that we had a, a big battle and uh, lost several of our guys and so uh, I knew where he was coming from so you know I got over in October the 22nd and we had our uh, a big battle uh, November the 11th so I knew right then I was uh, in a war zone and we had choppers uh, Don to take us into this hot LZ uh, had a squad of uh, or a platoon of uh, uh, mortar uh, armored personnel carriers were up on a hill and they were uh, surrounded by I guess uh, two or three battalions of NVA. Yes, North Vietnamese. North mostly, Vietnamese yeah. and they were uh, pretty much doomed if they didn't get somebody in there so we got my company got choppered in there in the middle of the night and uh, in fact the first uh, a group that they asked to do it said unless we get direct orders we're not doing it because they'd already had about three choppers down during the day. Three choppers shot down by the during, enemy. During the day and uh, they just said they wasn't going to do it and then the ghost riders with the 101st Airborne said we'll take you in there so so in the middle of the night they took us in there and that was uh, November I don't know 12th I think maybe when we got choppered in and and, and this, uh, this is the so big battle that, that you're talking about. Yeah, that, yeah, and that's one that Lou Pepe wrote about. If you that book, uh, my brothers had my back, and so, mm -hmm. so I knew I was pretty much in the war zone by the end of that time. And, that, and from there on, it kind of holds throughout, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. For your your full. So Army mm -hmm. did a year in Vietnam. Uh, you know, a, a tour for a soldier would be a year mm -hmm. tour for a marine is 13 months so you got well, they, they cut it down to a year that there at the last at it the was end. but when I first went away it was 13 months 13 months so this was a war that um, you know helos are used a bit in in Korea but it's really Vietnam where the, right. I mean the helo is, is is central so Don when you when you look at that photo there um, just what are the what, what comes to your mind first you, that photo, that photo taken of, I'd that say that looking at the people on the ground, uh, that means that Charlie wasn't there. That's we're called the Indian country or Charlie, or, you know the. Victor Charlie. The, I mean, it's uh, a, but anyway, the Viet Cong, right? As, you, as you look at those men standing there, a helicopters coming in for one reason: resupply. Oh yeah. yeah. Bringing in sea rations, water, and ammo. Because they're they're not expecting any trouble, or they wouldn't they'd be down. Yeah. So that's that's a well, that's a sign. So let's you know? let's just run through it. I mean, let's say in let's say in a, a month, what different kind of missions would you would it, you? Say? It would. One one day we could have a strike, uh, take a battalion or two, and, <coughs> and a bunch of helicopters and haul them in. Marines out and then supplies. the next day you're resupplying them or, or bringing back medevacs of wounded and anytime it had operations like that why 
it'd be at least one battalion out there. And uh, we continuously resupplied them and, and picked up medevacs. And, and, getting, getting wounded and, Ken, and Ken, Ken can tell you, most of the fighting was done at night. Biggest part of it was nighttime attacks. And we had to go out and do medevacs. And when we'd come in, it didn't, you know, most of the time we didn't see much. We just very little that they would, because of uh, the North Vietnamese were getting used to smoke and stuff like that, our colors and stuff, what we'd thrown out, right. and helicopters coming in. So when we was coming in, well, we'd draw fire. We'd, we'd get shot at pretty bad. And at nighttime, you can see those tracers and, you know, I mean, Tracers is the, just the, tracers, just one that you don't see four or five of. These are bullets coming at you. Yeah. Yeah. And so. And what what was your what was your particular job on the? I s I sat in the door on the other side, and my gunner, my first mech was. You can see the gun barrel sticking out this yeah. side. Well, my first mech it worked on the helicopter with me. He was my gunner, and he he sat in the window on that side, and I sat in the door on the other side. Did you also have a machine gun? And I also had a machine gun. You can see that picture uh, is a machine gun that sits in the door. And sometimes we used a lot of ammo, and sometimes it was M60 machine guns, both of them were. And I had a pistol that I carried on my side, but uh, the pilots, they, they normally carried a pistol. Yeah. But, uh, Going in, coming out of a hot zone, as we call them, where you're drawing fire, going in, coming out. Why, me and my my first mech as a gunner, mm -hmm. why we were we were laying down fire, you know, with the machine gun. And the worst I ever got into we was in a flight of 36. It's a place called Hep Duck. You had 36 helos going simultaneously. Yeah, at yeah. one time, in a line. And a place called Hep Duck, and this is just it's in between Da Nang and Chu Lai, over the first mountain range. It's it's up off the coast. It's but it's a place called Hep Duck, and uh, we got shot up real bad. Uh, Meaning helos down and well, fuel cell shot, uh, engine shot. The first helicopter going in was there was eight of another squadron ahead of us, and we had eight. And it all started out as a resupply, and found out that the outposts had got overrun during the night by a regiment of NVA. So the outposts and Marines have been overrun by the enemy. Yeah. Well, the uh, it was a uh, South Vietnamese and had army oh. army uh, ad advisors with them yeah. at the outposts. Yeah. And they got overran, and everybody was killed. And uh, anyway, we started hauling Vietnamese troops in. South Vietnamese allies. South Vietnamese. We started hauling them in, and we was going in, and we was in a valley going down between two mountains, in the, in the river valley down there, and there's a village below the outpost. And when we started in, it, it was a bright, sunshiny day, and you couldn't see nothing but red dots coming up. Those the tracers? Just coming up. They just coming up like that, just red dots. And the first helicopter in, the crew chief was killed. And then the eight helicopters that our squadron was in, in the flight, uh, we had uh, one pilot get wounded and two crewmen get wounded. And I don't know what happened the rest of them, but all you could hear was my, something was, you know, bad. Yeah. And, uh, but two times in and two times out, well, the first 16 went in, and I was the 12th one from the front. And we went in and we jumped out. Each one of us had 10 Vietnamese, South Vietnamese troops. And they, the rest of them turned back. And they brought in air support and bombed and strafed that place. And then we went back in again. But uh, the 160 South Vietnamese troops that we dropped off 
they were all dead when we come back on the second wave, wow. the second time. Wow. And then there was none of them alive. And when we come back through again, but with me and my first mech with the two M60 machine guns, and we carried 700 rounds of gun, and we fired every one of them. Wow. There wasn't a bullet left. Let's let's come to to this specific day, and then we'll and then we'll we'll go back to Ken. So you have two tours of Vietnam. During your first tour, you're wounded, and that day is May 29, 1966. Just work. Tell us what what happened. Well, just about a mile north of Chu Lai Airstrip, a sniper got me. And were the, you were you in the air? Yeah, and he shot through the bottom of the helicopter and got me. And that, and I was real close to Med Battalion. It was just over the hump. <laughs> and, and within and five minutes, I was at Med Battalion. Where, where did you get hit in the foot? Or no, uh, this leg here, about right there, it hit and split my leg open to the bone. The bullet came through the floor and just missed this foot. Ripped my leg open. The bullet had to flip when it came through the floor, because if it had just been, uh, you know, straight in and out, it wouldn't have been near as bad. But it ripped my leg open down to the bone, and so it took a little longer to heal up. But um, did you know immediately what had happened, or did it take you a little while uh, to figure that out? Well, I knew I got shot but I didn't know where. I had on flak vest. I had my hand on the gun. And I was in halfway decent territory, you know, where you don't get shot at. But I had my hands on the machine gun in front of me. And my leg, it got, I didn't know it. But that's the last place I looked. Anyway, my hands were numb from impact. The bullet went through my leg, then hit the ammo box on the side of the machine gun with 100 rounds in it. It messed up 13 rounds in that, that box. It came out of that machine gun box, the bullet there, and came out and hit my flak vest and ripped my flak vest and it went off my shoulder. And it did this to me. And I thought I was shot right there in my shoulder. And I, I looked at my hands and I had on flight gloves. There was nothing there. They were numb from the impact on the bullet hitting the gun. And then I looked down and from about here down, I have on a green flight suit. And it just like somebody had loaded a gun with sausage and, and shot me, and just sprayed. And that's just the way it, my legs and the lower part of my body looked. It just, it just splattered the flesh on my leg and how long was it before um, a corpsman or some sort of medical assistance got to you five minutes just right back to base or yeah we we, we just had to fly about well with less than five minutes and the guys it was in chow time you know time to eat and when any time a helicopter flew across the mat where we park our helicopters Anytime it flew across and landed the med battalion, everybody, as soon as it goes across, they know somebody's hit. And the guys were standing in the chow line, they said, and my first mech, he, he was putting a pressure bandage on my leg. He was squatted down in front of me, and he was doing that when we went across the chow line and landed in med battalion while they had to, had to, we called the meat wagon, you know, they had it out there, and I took off flak vest, my helmet, and my gun, and everything, and just laid it in the helicopter, and I just grabbed the whole top of the door, the old 34, and swung out on a stretcher. And, but uh, did they did they send you to Japan or Guam, or did you stay in Vietnam? I I ended up going to Guam, <clears throat> but the thing was when I seen where I was hit. My flight suit was ripped open, and I, it was just, you know, laying open like that. And I just took my flight glove, the chamois, you know, white, the chamois glove, and I just pressed on it. And when I got up there and the, the, the doctor was cutting my flight suit leg off, I, 
he said something, and I said, what do you mean, Doc? And he said, uh, dry wound. And uh, I said, well, when I seen it where it was at, I said, it seemed like five minutes, but I know it couldn't have been over 10 seconds. And I said, I pressed on it. And he said, well, the shock of getting ripped open and then you pressing on it, he said, you sealed the veins. Wow. And so my, my first mech, his name Brown, Gilbert Brown, he lived down, if he's still alive, down by Fort Pope, Louisiana. He lives down there. And uh, but then with Brownie, he, uh, he said there was only three drops of blood on the floor, even though my leg was ripped mm -hmm. open down to the bone. How long were you in Guam? Oh, about six weeks. And then back to Nam? No, I went to back to Okinawa. Okay. And in Okinawa, there's a fellow there that took care of the aviation marines. And uh, there was three pilots there, three captains that was pilots from my squadron. And they were there on their way back to States. And anyway, he asked me if I would go back to squadron, you know, ready to go back to squadron. I said, well, if I have to. And they talked to him and sent me to Iwakuni, Japan. Okay. So I went up there and I worked on C-54s as those old, old big planes with four engine, okay. reciprocating engine, not jets. Yeah. But you do end up back in Vietnam for a second tour. And then that was in uh, July of, uh, latter part of July of... Uh, 67? 66. 66. And I got orders to Santa Ana, California. And I got back. I got back to Siloam in September of '66, and it really wasn't no big welcome. Even people I knew, old veterans, they never asked me a thing. You know, even though, mm -hmm. I, and so I, I never. And then I got. I went to California, and at Santa Ana, you couldn't wear a uniform town. If you wore a uniform tan, you get spit on. Yeah. It wasn't treated well. So we never wore a uniform tan. I was there for 30 months and then I got orders. I got promoted from sergeants to staff sergeant in Santa Ana and, and I got orders back over to Vietnam, back to Vietnam. in April of 69. Yeah. Let's, let's go back to Ken. Ken, maybe where we could pick up is, you know, you're. Oops, where are you? There you are. Um, you know, you're on the ground, you're walking through the elephant grass, you're in the jungle, you're setting mines. You know, Don's doing, doing his work. Of course, you guys are in different branches of the, of the military. But I wonder, just, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Vietnam vets say that, you know, even 50 years later when they hear a helicopter, that sound just brings them, brings them right back. Yeah. Um, what... Um, I mean, just maybe, maybe it's a weird question, but from the perspective of, a, of you know, infantry, you're, on, you're spending most of your time on the ground, um, you know, the importance of the, of the helicopters, I mean, I, I guess the, the, question, I, the question I really have, and it, you know, may, it may bomb as a question, we'll see how it goes, <laughs> but the question is, you know, can you think of a time when you were in Vietnam when you were really happy to hear that sound of that helo? coming in. You could hear it in the distance and you, and you know it's coming and it's coming for your right. crew. Is there anything that comes to mind when, when you think well, about that? Well, uh, you know, we're, we're out in the bush and we're getting rained on and we're wet and we're eating sea rations and so it, they may be bringing you a hot meal. So yeah, it sounds good. You know, the cook, uh, you know, they have all these big uh, uh, containers full of food and, uh, and they it pull, it lands and they bring out the hot chow and they throw out a big pile of Army fatigues, one size fits all, and and uh, so yeah, you know it bring and it brings the mail, you know. Uh, oh, I yeah, remember one particular time, so it was a connection to home, and so yeah, it uh, and yeah, you know I can I can hear a, a helicopter for miles. Just I think the the vibration before I even actually hear it, you know, and uh, it's a very distinct sound and. Uh, you know, it might be, uh, you know, it took you into some places you didn't really 
uh, want to go, you know, but, uh, you know, these guys are risking their lives going in to a place where they know they're going to receive uh, uh, fire, and so, uh, you know, everybody had a job to do, and you just had to buckle down and do it, so, you know, it might take us into a place to where, you know, maybe we needed to... Uh, help somebody that was in trouble uh, you know the helicopters took us there and, you know they would take out the injured mm -hmm. uh, so uh, mm -hmm. you know you got all these mixed I guess emotions when you hear a helicopter but some of it was good and some of it was bad that's some what? of the tall you know the stuff that was unscathed by the agent orange the defoliant and uh, mm -hmm. you know when you got into some of those jungles I mean it's uh slow going. Uh, you had to beat your way through with machete and, and take turns, you know, because it just wear you down. So we just kind of keep rotating. Leeches? You know, I, I, a lot of our people had leeches. I, I never had a leech on me. I really? guess because I am a leech, but uh, yeah, his last name is Leech, so <laughs> they left me alone. But uh, snakes, a lot of snakes. I encountered a big cobra while I was over there. Uh, about from here to the wall from him, and his old head raised up and swelled up, and I'm trying to figure out what to do because we're in columns of three, and, and we're in a thick jungle, and I don't, except, you know, for the little clearing we came to where the snake was, and I didn't, we were supposed to be sneaking up on the enemy, and, and so I didn't really want to shoot him, and I didn't know where my other columns were, and so I didn't want to take a chance on shooting one of my guys, and while well, I'm figuring this all out. He just takes he, off. He took off. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a few snakes. We had one guy that got up uh, in the morning and pulled up his poncho liner, and he'd been sleeping on it, and there's a little cobra about this long right under his poncho liner. <laughs> Snuggled up with him. And when you're fighting, I mean, this, this style of war, a lot of things that make this war tough, <coughs> different from the Korean War. I mean, the Korean War is a traditional kind of war, right? If, mm -hmm. If we are tomorrow where they are today, we're winning, right? If we're pushing them back, we're winning. This is a very different war, though, right? You don't know where the enemy is, right? It's well, ambush. A lot of times you don't. Yeah, a lot yeah. of our battles were ambushes. Talking about that high grass, we we went up into the what they call high grass country mm -hmm. from the coast, which, which is over two mountain ranges, and then it's flat up there. Yeah. And that stuff, he, he can tell you, it's taller than your head. Yeah. But they put uh, bamboo, uh, pointed bamboo sticks in the ground. Punji sticks in the ground. Yeah, and they were, you know, traps. we're talking about big yeah. things, you know. It's big yeah. around and then there's sharp point on them. And with helicopters, it, you, you'd land while you punch holes through the bottom of the helicopter and get fuel cells. Mm -hmm. This is how, you know, but, uh, a, a poor enemy, you know, because the Viet Cong, they don't have helos right. mm -hmm. but they come up with creative inexpensive ways to and they would fight back a lot of those traps they would dip them in human feces so that the, you know the person that stepped on it not only cut him but he'd get a real nasty he'd infection get yeah and mm -hmm. that you know if you get one guy injured and two or three people taking care of him well that that might take four or five people out of the battle you know yeah. so let's uh we've got we've got about 15 minutes left, about 12 minutes left, and Ken, remind me of, of who this fellow is. His name is Boy Tang, and he was uh, what we called a, um, well, a Kit Carson scout. He's and these, North Vietnamese. Yeah, they're defected either South Vietnamese, VC, Viet Cong, or uh, North Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese, NBA, but they defected from their uh, army to our army for most of them were I mean the North Vietnamese army they were mistreated and you know they might not get pay and they could they you know maybe out in the jungle for for a year and not get any mail or get promotions I mean uh, and so because of their uh, ill treatment some of them defected to our side did you did you feel like you could trust Bo him? Boy Tang was a good one I really trusted him a hundred percent. He was a good little guy. Yeah. Well, let, let's use this photo to, to kind of think about this this theme. And um, you know, President Kennedy in '63 um, 
was asked about Vietnam, and Vietnam was not a big deal yet in 63. Um, and President Kennedy, of course, President Kennedy is assassinated, and then President Johnson is the one who picks up, and the war really heats up under President Johnson's administration. But President Kennedy repeated in this, in this interview with Walter Cronkite that it's their war. This is the war of the people of South Vietnam. They've got to win it. You know, we can, I'm, I'm, like, I'm almost quoting, I think, verbatim. <coughs> they've got to win it. We can help them. But, but they've got to win it. And I'll, I'll pitch this, this question to both of you. I mean, whatever interactions you had, some Vietnam vets had very little interaction with, with uh, Vietnamese allies or with, you know, Kit Carson scouts like this. Others had a lot of interaction with South Vietnamese allies. Um, did you have that feeling? I mean, you're, let's focus on your first, your first tour in Vietnam. Did you have that feeling that this is their war and we're here to help them? Or did you have, that, did you have the feeling like it's our war and they're kind of here maybe doing stuff? What, what was your feeling? I mean, did, did, I guess I'm, I'm asking, did your experience line up with what President Kennedy said in 63, this is their war. They have to win it. We can help them, but this is their war. What, what, did that line up with your experience? We, uh most of the outposts, they were uh, South Vietnamese troops with Army uh, advisors. With U.S. Army advisors. Yeah. yeah. They normally had maybe two or three advisors, <clears throat> and they'd have a company of, of uh, South Vietnamese and the outposts. And we used to go in, we went into a lot of those outposts, and uh, where they, uh, we resupplied them because they were off out you know, in the valleys and the mountains, yeah. And they were they were out there trying to see where the NBA were coming down and so on. But uh, in our part, uh, we resupplied them, and uh, and if they got overrun, we hold normally uh, like a one uh, outpost is south of Quang Nai that uh, almost got overrun. And there wasn't a handful left, but they got support in there. And we we hauled a second battalion, fifth Marines in it, break it on. They got us up early, and we we lost them out. We hauled troops in there, but they, it's just something you know you you never believe. And of course, Ken may be able to verify this. They had to stack bodies so we could land a helicopter in time. That's how bad it was. What, what do you mean? You had the South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese both. They had to stack bodies to get them get the ground clear so we could land. Oh, I see. To, to clear. They had them stacked up seven high. So this, this, this would be a case where we would say, okay, at least in this case, the South Vietnamese. The Constantina War and stuff out there, Ken, he knows what I'm talking about. And they had, they had mines in there and everything, but uh, the NVA, the North Vietnamese, they were they were just laying thick in that that wire, and uh, but the South Vietnamese troops that was in the in there defending the outpost, uh, they almost were all killed, and they had and they had so many bodies around that they had to stack them up in order for us to come in there and land a few helicopters at a time in that outpost. So certainly the South Vietnamese forces paid a heavy price. And you know, veterans will have, you know, truthfully, I mean, most veterans who worked with South Vietnamese forces don't have a very high opinion of, of the South Vietnamese forces, but there are cases. Go ahead. We, uh, we, we had to happen, I'm sure the Army did too, that we figured about, in our own mind, we just we figured 10% of the South Vietnamese troops were Viet Cong. So you had enemy but, infiltrated because in they'd the been South some Vietnamese. of them turned around and shot pilots, and when he's off out there a little ways, they turn around. So when they when we haul Vietnamese troops, not like me, I sat on the door with a gun. My safety was off, and my finger, my finger was on the trigger. If one of them turned around and pointed a gun back to head towards the helicopter, he was dead. Yeah, but so I, I never, I never had to. 
do, do it. it. But uh, it was something. And another thing, yeah. I hope being the meat troops one day, and this was when I was just early in 65, when I was over there, latter part of 65, they all come out and my first mech turned around and looked and there's a hand grenade laying in the floor and the pin was pulled. And it so happened that hand grenade didn't go off. It was a dud or I wouldn't yeah. be here today. So, you know, just to pick up on this, what we're, there, there are just so many things that make this war especially difficult. I mean, the, the terrain, the heat, the Cobras, the, the, the style of warfare, and then an ally that a lot of times we don't feel we can trust. Yeah. Ken, in, in your experience, you know, by the time you get there, President Kennedy's been off the scene for a long time, but just to give that quote again, this is their war, they have to win it, we can help them, but they've got to win yeah. it. D does that fit, match you with know, your experience from, at all? No. Uh, from what I saw of them, most of, our, uh, most of us felt like their hearts were never really in, into fighting this war, and I don't know if it's because of they had fear of repercussions because they were infiltrated by so many, you know, enemy soldiers that... Uh, uh, you know that they were afraid to do things. I don't know, uh, but we never did observe them to being look like they were really. I guess what we would call flaky. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they just didn't have their stuff together. Uh, mm -hmm. They just uh, uh, were not good warriors in, so that, in our that, experience. That does lead lead to the thought then. We just have a few minutes. I've got one one question left, but that, that does lead to the thought then that if the folks who are wearing the uniform of the country of South Vietnam don't seem devoted to the cause, then why are we here? Right? And that is one of the challenges right. of this that, war. That could be a, ch uh, a line of thought. I never had that thought. I feel I was yeah. pretty dedicated as a as a soldier, and you know, I'm just, I kind of have the idea, you know, just stay out of my way and, and we'll get the job done mm -hmm. if you all don't want to. But, you know, I think that the rural people, I could see, you know, how they were suppressed and, mm -hmm. you know, they're really intelligent people. The people that have came over here from Vietnam have really excelled in a lot of areas because mm -hmm. they're really smart people, but they never had a, any chance at all over there to express that, and they were just, they were suppressed, and so, uh, you know, that's why I think, you know, the whole thing, if we'd have done it right, was a good, honorable thing to do. If we'd have just gone about it different and done it, we, I think we would have done an honorable thing for, for a good people. Well, and I think um, the, what's going on in Vietnam right now supports what, what you're saying, because they've given up on the communist fantasy Right. And they're joining the market. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, Vietnam is is turning toward the free market and away from communist economics because communist economics don't work. They just don't work. Yeah. Just real quick, um, and uh, let's uh, pitch it first to Ken and, and then then to Don. I mean, here you are talking to talking to young folks, uh, some of whom don't act, don't have a living memory of 9/11, believe it or not. So Vietnam. It's almost like the Crusades or something. It's, it's way back there. But what, what do you think young people should know about the Vietnam War? Start with Ken and then Don. Just what, what should young people today know about the Vietnam War? Well, uh, that uh, the, because it, you know, like I mentioned, that, that most of us that were over there, or a lot of us, you know, some of us were there just because the Army said we're going and, and that's our job. But you know, if you're going to do something as extreme as fighting a battle, you, you want to kind of have something in the back of your mind that you're doing the right thing. And I think if you are helping other people, people, it, it just goes to basically to the basics of people being bullied that, you, you know, we talk about in schools and if we see another country being shoved and bullied and, and trying to be forced to do something that they don't want to do and, uh, you know, it, it's... Um, I think to some extent, I mean, we can't police the whole country, but uh, I think in Vietnam's case, uh, you know, we were, these people asked us for help. Uh, they were trying not to be overcome by communism, which is a bad uh, uh, system. 
and we were sent there to help them. So it was an honorable thing, and uh, we were fighting for their freedom and the uh, freedom to make their own choices. And freedom is something that a lot of, I hope you young people don't take that for granted because the old saying that freedom is not free, you think of all the people that have uh, given up their life and their, their way of life and given up, uh, you know, so much to make your, that you can come here and be educated and, and excel to the best of your ability to the most your potential that you have, you, you, there's no limit to what you can do and that's because you are free and that's because somebody died for that freedom and, and in Vietnam, uh, at least uh, from my perspective, that's why I was there to give people an opportunity to be free where they could make their own decisions and do the best that they could with the abilities that they had. Mm. I think it was an honorable thing to do uh, you know, if you took the politics out of it and let the military do their job, uh, there was just a lot of crazy things uh, that uh, kept us from doing our our very best. That uh, that's my take on it. Thanks, Don. And uh, just a, uh, what what's what do you think young people should know about the the Vietnam War? Well, like Ken said, it, it was a political war. And we got involved in it, uh, but uh, the thing I, I met a couple of fellows in Washington D.C. We had uh, this helicopter that we got a picture of, with just like that one is up there. It's over at Inola, Oklahoma, just this down the road between here and Tulsa. That helicopter's over there, and it does still flies. They rebuilt it, and I run with it for about six years, and uh, it was in my squadron in Vietnam. And uh, but anyway, we were in Washington D.C. with this helicopter sitting up off the Washington Monument parking lot, and there was two, not at the same time, but two fellows came up. And they wanted to shake all of our hands, and it was about six or seven of us there. And we shook hands with him, and he said, uh, "I want to thank you for what you did for us." And he was South Vietnamese mm. that had come to this country, yeah. and it wasn't too. And he's the first one told us that he he had served eleven years and a few months in prison after U.S. pulled out. And then a little bit later, another one came up, and he wanted to shake everybody's hand, and he thanked us for what we did. And uh, he served a little over eight years in prison. That was South Vietnamese. South Vietnamese. Yeah. And they were both moved to this country. That's but uh, seeing that old Marine <laughs> helicopter and everything there, you know, he wanted to. He wanted to thank both of them. Wanted to thank us for what we what we did. And I'll I'll just jump in to show the students if students if you haven't been to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's by far the most powerful memorial. Well, I in, got pictures in, in of it at home. Yeah, I got lots of pictures of but me I, me by the wall, really. Uh, you guys be sure uh, to thank Mr. Martin, and Mr. Leach on your way out. Thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a privilege. Appreciate it.